Well, I, I guess my title is something like my small bit of MBE history. I am really delighted to be uh, sitting with all these great pioneers like Al Cho and, and uh, Tom Fox and so on and so forth, uh, uh, and sharing what we went through in the early years of uh, learning about MBE. Now, it's said in the program that we're going to be telling you how to do things right. Uh, and I think what I should say is that uh, good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. So what I'm going to talk about principally is, bad, is, is incidents of, of bad judgment. Uh, I guess that my uh, activities in MBE really began back in graduate school when I became a very skilled glass blower. My research involved making uh, field emission microscopes, and I learned to make them all the way from uh, making the metal, glass to metal seals, fluorescent screens, blowing everything. Uh, and that served me in good stead when I, when I got to Bell Labs. Now, a, a lot of it, I, I really want to emphasize what it was like at Bell Labs in those days. I think that this, those were probably the golden years of Bell Labs, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's still as great as it was then. But uh, my first experience was when I, uh, on the first day of my employment there, I walked down the corridor with uh, my new department head, and all of a sudden, a man, an elderly man came out of a darkened room, grabbed a hold of my arm, and pulled me in and said, come on, you've got to see this. I had no idea who this guy was. But I went into the room, and here was a low-energy electron diffraction screen glowing in the dark uh, with spots all over it. And he showed me what it looked like when oxygen absorbed on nickel. Well, the man was, was Lester Germer. Uh, of the Davison-Germer experiment fame. Uh, Lester had one of two lead systems in Bell Labs at, at the time. Uh, anyway, uh, Lester turned out to be a, a fantastic man. He was a, became a great friend of mine. Uh, we did lots of mountain climbing together. When Lester was in the mountains, he talked about science. When he was in the laboratory, he talked about climbing in the mountains. Uh, <laughs> I could, I could spend my whole time telling you Lester Germer's stories because he, he was really a unique character. But uh, there were a lot of unique characters there at Bell Labs. In uh, Hagstrom's uh, uh, surfaces, surface physics department, uh, Walter Bratton was, was still there, uh, who was another character. Um, Walter was known for throwing a tantrum when things in the committee meetings didn't go his way. Uh, but he was also a very interesting and helpful person to know. And uh, Bill Shockley uh, came frequently to the labs. He was back in California permanently, but uh, uh, he was one of the best, one of the best teachers I ever heard. Uh, he could give a lecture on something really abstract and you knew exactly what he was talking about. He was incredible. Uh, Brat, Brat, um, Bardeen came occasionally. Uh, he was a little more difficult to understand. But the point is that there were all these, these fascinating people around. Um, my next door neighbor next to my home was George Smith. And George Smith and Bill Boyle in the, in the uh, 80s developed the, the charge, couple, or charge couple device, CCD, uh, uh, for detecting light that became such an, in, uh, such an important key for those working in astronomy. So the list goes on and on and on. There was a man who was studying gravity waves, believe it or not. Uh, he didn't find any, I have to say. But uh, th that's, the, that's some of the kinds of research that were going on there. It was very, it was very academic. On the other hand, and uh, Mort Panish is around here somewhere. He's, I'm going to, yeah, there he is, okay. I'm going to say some critical things here, too. The facilities at Bell Labs were terrible. Uh, the, the labs and offices were, were primitive. They were like the ones that I'd had back in graduate school. 
there was a, a gutter that ran around the lab for cooling water to be dispersed. And uh, it was fine when the gutter, when the water was flowing in the, in the, in the gutter, but uh, when it would dry up, the man up above me might do some noxious experiment and pour the stuff down the drain, and I'd get it down in my lab. Uh, this is Bell Labs now. You don't, this, is, this is, I think, part of the story that you, you, you haven't heard before. Uh, there were frequent fires. About once a week, I'd come into the labs and I'd see smoke coming out of the, out of the, out of the chimneys. The safety precautions were dreadful. They, I mean, there was, as far as I know, there was no safety committee. Uh, the things that we did, some of the things we did, we did were, were ha really hazardous. Uh, a lot of people got, got acid, but one time I spilled a whole flask of acid down, down the front and my pants dissolved. Uh, and fortunately I had a lab coat that I could get on and my, uh, my technician called my wife and she brought me another pair of pants, so everything was fine. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there were, there were these, these sorts of, of things going on. Well, one, one thing I want to emphasize here that is that I'm really happy to be here today um, because I almost didn't make it. We drove up to Portland uh, Friday night so that I could st we could stay over in a motel and catch the early flight out of Portland Airport. And in the morning, uh, the news was all full of the fires burning in Corvallis, Oregon. And it sounded from the description as though they were right where my house is. My house is in the woods on a hill. So I called around and couldn't find anybody awake to answer the phone. Finally, I got a hold of a friend and he said, no, it was not my house or not my area. It was about a, a half a mile north or half a mile south of my area. So I was able to get back on the plane and everything was fine. But uh, I thought for a minute there it was going to be, it was going to be touch and go. Um, so anyway, I'm here. And now getting back to where I was at Bell Labs, uh, the equipment that we had was pretty primitive too. Uh, we were mostly using ultra high vacuum systems made out of glass with mercury diffusion pumps. Uh, the same kind of system that Lester Germer and, and Davison used in the Davison Germer experiment uh, that, uh, that worked because of an accident, you know. They're, the way they were doing the experiment, it wasn't going to work because they were using a polycrystalline uh, a filament of, of a polycrystalline a ribbon of, of uh, nickel, no, yeah, nickel, and it would have given them, they wouldn't have gotten the diffraction spots, but the, the vacuum system cracked during bake out, let oxygen in, the oxygen got onto the nickel, and in the process of cleaning it up, uh, Germer annealed it to the point where it, the crystal grains grew large enough so that when they did the experiment, they would get diffraction off, off the uh, individual crystal grains. That's why the, why the thing worked. Point here is that there is accident avail that happens in a lot of experiments, and uh, we have to take advantage of it when it does occur. The, um, the one great thing to say about uh, uh, Bell Labs, though, was the stock room was in was fantastic. You could go up to the stock room and find almost anything you wanted. Uh, I finally built a glass vacuum system with metal seals, with, with, with metal flanges to join so I could take it apart. And uh, these were home-built uh, flanges, just perfectly flat. And we used gold wire, uh, annealed gold wire to form the seal. And I could go up in the stock room and get a, a, a coil of gold wire and come back in my lab and make rings of, of gold, and, and, and they worked beautifully. And after I'd built, they, they worked beautifully once, and after I'd built up a stash of used gold O-rings, I'd take them back to the uh, stock room and they'd accept them. As far as I know, there was no, no accounting for all of, this, all of this gold that was being used. Anyway. Uh, that's a, that's a side point. The big surface problem that we had in those days, though, was surface cleaning. With metal, it was, you know, you could heat 
metal up to the point where uh, things were, were pretty clean. But uh, semiconductors were a different problem. And the characterization of it, we had no tools for characteri characterizing these things. Finally, we didn't know what was in the vacuum. And in the mid-60s, uh, I did find out that there was a new thing on the, on the market called the quadrupole mass spectrometer. And I really, really wanted to have one because I had just the experiment for it. Unfortunately, Bell was a little bit uh, careful about their expenses. And right at first, they didn't have the $15,000 to buy my quadrupole mass spectrometer. But uh, my laboratory director, a man named John Galt, who, about whom I'll say more later, uh, came up with a novel idea. He was going to lease this mass spectrometer. And so we got the quadrupole mass spectrometer, leased it, and uh, I started doing some experiments with it. Well, Mark Panish came to me, and uh, he was doing liquid phase epitaxy, but he needed to know more about the thermodynamics of the gallium arsenic system. So he asked if I would measure vapor pressures of arsenic and gallium over gallium arsenic. So I could do that with my quadrupole mass spectrometer. Worked like a charm. And and uh, Mort uh, seemed to be happy with the result. And that justified my mass spectrometer purchase so that we then purchased the thing completely. Uh, at a, we, we quit paying the down payments and bought it. Uh, and that allowed me to get started on this experiment that I really wanted to do, which was to look at, to measure surface lifetimes. I wanted to shoot a beam of atoms off of a surface and determine uh, what the lifetime of the a of atoms was on the surface. So you make a chopped beam. You fire, fire a chopped pulse of gallium, say, at gallium arsenide, and you look at the gallium bouncing off at a, as a function of temperature. And if we could turn, there it is, OK. That's just the, a, a mathematical depiction of, of what it looks like at three different temperatures. But it's a first simple first order differential equation. The solution is straightforward. You get an exponential, one minus exponential rise and an exponential tail on the thing. And that's exactly what we found with gallium on gallium arsenide. Furthermore, the, uh, the enthalpy of vaporization, which you get from the temperature dependence of these curves, agreed exactly with, with what we'd already measured in the, in the, uh, in the uh, mass spectrometer experiments. So this was behaving perfectly normally. The next slide, please. So I tried it with, with arsenic. Tried doing the, the same thing with arsenic. And in arsenic, the behavior was quite different. Now, you can see that when I turn the beam on, there is a, an abrupt rise. There's no, no decay in the, in the rise. And there's a gradual increase in the arsenic beam coming off just because the background arsenic pressure is getting higher. Uh, but then when I turn the beam off, then it comes right back down. So we've got basically square pulses that we're getting. But when there was a little bit of gallium on the surface, it behaved totally differently. And you can see that there is a, now an a uptake of arsenic it's not, not bouncing off the surface when there's gallium present. So this suggested that here is a way to make stoichiometric compound films. Uh, there had been a lot of people had done a lot of work in trying to evaporate compound semiconductors prior to this. Uh, they do such things as uh, putting and ar putting a gallium arsenide source in a tube and heating it up and then figuring out that somewhere along the length of this tube, the atoms would be arriving at the surface to make a stoichiometric film. Well, what this showed was that uh, you didn't need to worry about that, that you could make a stoichiometric film just from, just from these molecular beams. And um, this was a pretty con con convenient way to, to, uh, to do it. Uh, and it uh, suggested 
uh, then that we should start trying to find, start trying to see what kind of, uh, of crystallinity we got, Try, uh, trying to grow films, in other words. Uh, so the only way that I could determine what, was, what my film crystallinity was in, what it was like, was to take the films down to an electron microscope uh, and the guy would do a, 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 a glancing beam diffraction pattern and tell me something about the films. And the results were kind of discouraging because they showed that we generally had twinned films. Uh, they, 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 were, they, were, they were crystalline, but, but it, they were twinned and not, not very good. So we had epitaxy, but we certainly didn't have single crystal epitaxy. About this time, uh, Mort uh, suggested that we should start calling this molecular beam epitaxy because well, we're using a molecular beam, we're also using an atomic beam. Uh, we sometimes got epitaxy and sometimes didn't. Uh, and these weren't really beams. These are really, kind of, you know, a be a, an atomic beam is really uh, well collimated and these weren't well collimated beams. But nevertheless, the name is good and has stuck. Uh, so that's what we're, what we're still, still using. Uh, Let's see, we're running out of time here. I better speed up. About this time, then, uh, John Galt and Mort decided that we really needed to put some more teeth in, into, this, into the effort. And uh, Al Cho uh, was hired from the University of Illinois, uh, which was in, in shows the extreme good judgment of uh, John Galt and, and Mort, uh, and uh, came to work with us. At, the, at first, um, we were given, the, the, it was suggested that we might try growing diamond film. And I, I <laughs> remember that, Al? We had an old glass system, uh, but we needed diamond substrates. So we walked down from Bell Labs about two or three blocks, and there was this little building where it went inside, and kind of older man in a white uh, uh, lab coat uh, invited us in and he pulled out a drawer and stuck in his scoop and started scooping out diamonds onto the, on, onto the counter. So we poured through these, these diamonds finding uh, ones that were large enough to, that we could take. I think we got up and spent about two or three hundred dollars, something like that, buying diamonds. We took them back, put them in our system and evaporated from graphite onto the diamonds and all we, that we got was a black scum on each, each diamond. Well, the problem there, or maybe the problem was, I think the problem was that we're, when you evaporate uh, graphite, you get carbon-8 molecules coming off. So you're already uh, basically putting graphite on back onto the surface of the diamond. So that didn't last very long. We, we canned that. And uh, I think that that was when Al got, Al had a really good piece of luck. He got Dick Henderson's uh, machine. Isn't this right? Okay. Well, all right. Well, anyway, at some point, Al got a vacuum system that had a high energy electron beam diffraction gun on it and was able to do some diffraction studies during growth. And I, I think that this was one of the absolute crucial points in MBE. It, it, said that the whole thing was going to work. Uh, Al can tell you more about the deep details of that. Well, this was also a, a time of the Vietnam War. And we were very, very conscious of, of this. Uh, every day at lunch, we'd gather around a circular, circular table, uh, eight or 10 of us, and discuss uh, what we thought was happening. And uh, it, it, was, it was kind of a gloomy uh, period of time. Um, long about then, uh, Mort found that there was a boron nitride manufacturer up in New Hampshire. So Mort and I got in the car and drove up to uh, Lawrence, New Hampshire. Uh, it was a long drive, uh, several hours to get up there. And here was this uh, factory on the ba banks of the Merrimack River. Uh, it had a, an old paddle wheel that, that uh, 
the, the water which would turn the wheel and generate electricity. I think they were still using it. Anyway, they told us how they made boron di nitride, take boron, ni boron trifluoride and pyrolyze it on a graphite mandrel so you can make uh, crucibles very easily this way. And I think we got some uh, boron nitride from them. I think Mort was using it for a while. But I think that this was the, the introduction of the idea of, of using boron nitride uh, uh, for containing some of our, uh, our materials. Um, well, to make things, to go a little faster here, I, became, I got sidetracked about this point. I finally got a metal system. And uh, that changed my pattern of thinking a lot. Uh, I decided it was, I was encouraged to try to, to grow super, uh, MBE superconductors and set up a program to uh, use E-beam evaporation to get refractory metals deposited. And uh, this was uh, looking promising, except that uh, one afternoon I was not paying attention and my technician uh, turned on the, on the machine and forgot to put the cooling water into the E-beam evaporator. And when that happens, uh, it gets pretty hot. And when that happens, the brazing melts. And all of a sudden, he realized that he'd done the wrong thing. So he turned on the water at that point <laughs> and filled up the bell jar. Well, maybe not totally full, but there was a lot of water in it. So that kind of ruined that experiment. Uh, we, uh, I began campaigning trying to get a, a, a new bell jar, a new, uh, new MBE system, uh, <clears throat> and was not very successful. So um, I had kind of a midlife crisis and decided that it was time to do something else. And uh, my old friends at the physical electronics uh, company invited me to come over and, and work with them. Uh, I think they did so because one of the things that I was doing at that time was using a low energy electron diffraction system to analyze the crystallinity of, of my uh, films. But I was using it also as an OJ system. You can, you can use a lead system to get the OJ spectrum. It's kind of, kind of crude and not very sensitive, but uh, it worked. But it has the advantage that you can scan the, the electron beam back and forth. And so I could do some scanning uh, what time do you want me to, Jim? Where, where's Jim? Are yeah. you? Are you yeah. So I don't know. Three or four minutes. Three, three or four minutes. Okay. Yeah. We we started late. I wasn't sure if you were going to make allowances. <laughs> 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 anyway, I went to Phi, uh, started trying to make MBE systems, and found that being a product uh, manager was very different from being a, being a scientist. Uh, it did uh, get me a lot of uh, interesting travel abroad. Uh, when the, uh, the uh, Ribeir, well, I call it the Ribeir meeting. Yeah, it was the Ribeir meeting, sponsored meeting in, in Paris came about. Uh, I uh, uh, went, went to that and uh, went to uh, uh, New York and, and, and met Ed Badgett, the Ribeir salesman there in, uh, uh, in, in in uh, New York, and he had, uh, had, had us rigged up with a great big basket full of French food that we ate all the way across uh, and had a wonderful time uh, getting over there. And I was it was my first visit to Paris, uh, very impressed, and I fell in love with the French coffee. And uh, I, I mentioned this because there is a picture in the display that uh, you'll see about, about this. The picture shows um, Al sitting at the table and, and me waving my hands around after uh, having uh, introduced him. Well, I was supposed to introduce him, but the fact of the matter was that with all that coffee, I couldn't get to sleep until something like 5 o'clock in the morning. And then when I did so, I didn't wake up. And my friends called me, uh, where are you? you know, you're supposed to be on. Well, so Al had to introduce himself. And as soon as he was finishing his talk, I strode up to the front and I said, are there any questions? <laughs> and I've never told that story. I've never admitted to Al that that's why it happened that way. But 
Al, I'm really sorry. That's the dumbest thing I ever did. Uh, shortly after, or sometime after that, I decided that product management was not uh, my, uh, my fort, forte. So I was fortunate to get uh, the chance to go to Oregon State University and, um, and set up an MBE program there. Uh, the only drawback to that was that I found I had to do a lot of, of money raising to uh, get things going. We wanted a new building and so on and so forth. So I had several uh, trips uh, to Salem to talk to the state legislature and the governor. I'm in, um, in, in um, one of these meetings with a, a committee, uh, I was telling them the beauties of what we were going to do and all this, all this detail about how wonderful this technique was for doing electronic things with crystals. And at the end of my uh, spiel, this uh, old legislator sitting in the back, he had his co cowboy boots on and his string tie and he just should have had a cigar in his mouth, but he didn't. Uh, anyway, he was sitting there leaning back and he said, tell me, professor, just what's the, what is an electron? <laughs> and there was a twinkle in his eye <laughs> and I knew I <laughs> had, so I, I started making some words. Uh, I'm not very good at expressing myself sometimes and finally my uh, my uh, dean tugged on my coat and told me it was time to sit down. Nevertheless, we got the money and we did build a new building. Uh, but that brought up another part of my experience was uh, learning how things are done in a university. Uh, in a university, you have committees for everything. And so our building was a building designed by a committee. And it, we had a nice clean room up in the upper floor. Unfortunately, every time it rained, the rain poured into the clean room. Uh, well, they finally got that fixed, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a lesson. Uh, the other thing that I found was that uh, I got all sorts of advice uh, from various other sources. For example, one, one uh, guy, one old man came into my, uh, into my office and he told me that he had a mountain of gallium that he and I could develop. And he meant it. I, I don't know what he ha actually had, but he had a mountain of galley. Well, then um, we did have another uh, prospect that sounded pretty good for a while. Okay, and Jim's looking, I'm, I'm almost finished. One last anecdote here. Uh, we, we had um, a guy that uh, wanted, he had, had a program for building sto solar cells. Uh, and he wanted us to get involved in this. this we were going to uh, make a lot of money with solar cells. Uh, it, uh, unfortunately, it turned out that where he was wanted to make the solars, where he wanted to put this plant, was where the Rajneeshis had built a settlement. The Rajneeshis were a, were a cult of, of sort of a Hindu-related, not really, but... Uh, but they wore saffron robes and so on. The only problem with that was they ran into trouble because at the very end, uh, they tried to poison the water supply uh, because the, the county commissioners were voting against them. Uh, so they ended in a, on a very sad note. And of course, we wanted to have nothing to do with putting arsenic into the area where, where these folks were. So that was a, that was a uh, thing. So, um, the end of it all is that uh, uh, shortly thereafter, I decided to retire, and I've been very happy in retirement ever since. And I am blown away by what MBE is doing nowadays. I really envy you guys getting to work with all those nice toys out there. But in, in, in I guess the summary that I would really like, to, the summary message is that this, progr this, this program, grow MBE grew because there was a corresponding parallel growth of the electronic equipment industry, I mean the, the uh, vacuum equipment industry, these tools, OJ spectroscopy, electron diffraction, so on and so forth, came along at exactly the right time. Timing is everything, and we had exactly the right timing, and that's why we're here today. Thank you.
Thank you, John. So we'll have, once the uh, speakers in this session and then the three in the second session after the break, then we're going to have a, a round table and a discussion, so we'll have some opportunity. You can ask questions uh, to uh, all six uh, oh, of the yes. first speakers here. Uh, the next speaker is Al Cho, uh, most often regarded as the father of MBE. Uh, he was born in Beijing and uh, came to the U.S. and received uh, his, all three of his degrees in electrical engineering at the University of Illinois. He joined Bell Laboratories as a member of the technical staff uh, and then was subsequently uh, promoted to department head in 1984, director of the materials processing lab in 87, and uh, director of the uh, semiconductor research laboratory in 1990. Among Ma Al's many research accomplishments uh, uh, beyond certainly the development of MBE were a very large number of device firsts. In the early days, he fabricated the first hyperabrupt junction varactor, impact mixers, <coughs> field effect transistors, and artificial super lattice. But one thing these all had in common was that they were all majority carrier devices, and people really wanted optical devices. And I can remember visiting Bell Labs, and uh, uh, most of his colleagues at that time thought, MBE, good luck. Uh, if you uh, hit it with a powerful enough laser, it'll get hot enough and it'll glow red. But uh, any radiative recombination was uh, a, a myth. <clears throat> and so Al uh, then really did a, a lot of pioneering work on finding out some of the, the difficulties uh, and background impurities and everything else that were uh, causing serious degradation of the material, and ultimately they decided to de develop the uh, first MB-grown double heterojunction uh, laser that operated at room temperature, and a uh, story that I had something to do with, the first monolithic Vixel uh, on gallium arsenide. Uh, we were at a device research conference and uh, ended up uh, both in the same bar at some late evening, and uh, Al was bemoaning the fact that he, they had this great result and it wasn't going to be presented. I said, what the hell's going on? That's what device research conference is for. So I was on the program committee, so I told Al, get your guy to the meeting. Tell him to go to Newark and fly to Boston uh, in the morning. And I said, the program committee won't meet until noon, but I called the program committee chair at 2 a.m., uh, and told Kalawa. him we have to have another, Kalawa. yeah, Bob Kalawa, <laughs> right. And uh, so the uh, committee said, yes, we'll uh, have this uh, presentation. It'll be the very last thing at the meeting. And I tell you, it was amazing that the room still, there were, the, the auditorium was more than filled. There were people standing there. There were, everybody stayed literally to the end of the, the conference to hear that uh, Vixel paper. So I guess I was forgiven for uh, my rudeness of calling uh, Callow at 2 a.m. Uh, so Al has received many awards for his work on uh, MBE, including the APS International Prize for New Materials, the IEEE Morris Liebman Award, the Gallium Arsenide Symposium Heinrich Velker Medal, uh, ECS Solid State Te Science and Technology Medal, the AVS Geta Langmuir Award, and uh, certainly probably the highlight, the National Medal of Science was presented by uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, Al is a member of the, both the National Academy of Science and the uh, uh, National Academy of Engineering, and he received the IEEE Medal of uh, Honor Award recently. So Al, well, it's a great you. Pri privilege uh, to introduce you. Thank you very much, Jim, for the introduction. John Otto, thank you for the nice introduction of uh, Bell Labs' uh, working environment. As you can see, we have uh, fairly primitive equipment when we started there, but the important thing is, I want to stress that point, what makes a, a place is the people in there. What Bell Labs at that time is the people in Bell Labs, what makes Bell Labs, the culture, and the way we approach things is what makes Bell Lab stand out above everybody else. 
Okay, now <coughs> let me uh, give my talk here. My talk today is how molecular bean apotax, the MBE, was invented. Now I want to show this first view graph. You already saw, I already pro provided that uh, in the poster there. And this is the first MBE conference, international conference, held in 1978, oh, uh, 1978 in Paris, uh, France. Many of you probably wonder, why do we held in Paris? Why is it not in the United States? MBE was invented in the United States. The reason is because at that time, uh, the, the, there was a big uh, uh, conglomerate investor uh, called Instrument SA in France. And uh, they bought Rebeer in 1976. After they bought the Rebeer, uh, the president of Instrument SA, Dr. Gilbert Hyatt, came to me at Bell Labs, asked me, uh, do you want to have an international MBE conference so that we can make the whole world knows that uh, Rebeer is making MBE equipment? That's what the bottom line was. And he said, uh, uh, Rebeer will pay all the expenses. And I was surprised at that time. I said, okay, uh, go ahead, do it. So this is the, the meeting. You can see on the top picture there, John Osler was on the podium there. I sit on the first chair there, Alcho. And the next one is Pierre Auger. In France, of course, they want to bring out the best of their scientists. Pierre Auger is the Auger, Electron Auger, that we read in the textbook at that time. And then he gave the first plenary talk, opened the international conference. And then the next two people is uh, Boucher and Xilin, they were actually the managers of Revere. Because they paid a bill, they got a chair on it. And here, uh, Boucher getting more fat, but he's sitting there. At that time, he's a young, he was younger. And uh, <coughs> uh, now I want to start this talk about my outline. My outline is how was molecular bean epitaxy MB invented? Then I will say, what was the road from basic research to production, which is a long, hard road for me to uh, go through. And then finally, why is MBE the best technology for exploring new nano devices as well as for mass production? Now, as devices were getting smaller and smaller in the 1960s, and there's a demand for us to make small device as small as 500 Amstrons, 1,000 Amstrons. At that time, the liquid phase epitaxy had difficult to produce, reproduce that thickness. So uh, we, we need to have a new way to grow crystals. So MBE, John Arthur and I in the United States, and Bruce Joyce and Tom Foxen in England were studying adsorption, desorptions, of atoms or molecules from solid surfaces in the 1960s. And we try to apply uh, this knowledge to uh, surface physics to grow thin films. Uh, I want to particularly thank John Osser because I learned uh, from, from him uh, in regard how he evaporate gallium arsenide for making thin films at that time when I finished school to uh, uh, Bell Labs. But I want to just correct one thing. Uh, when I was hired to Bell Labs, at that time the department head was Carl Thurman. But Carl Thurman was just kind of sick, and uh, John Galt, the director, one that was hired, was uh, in charge for the department. And then I was hired by John Galt. And after John Galt hired me, then we have a new department head, was Jeffrey Garrett. I have Jeffrey Garrett for over a year, then more Panish promoted become new department head of mine, so he was uh, in charge of the department uh, after that. So anyway, uh, so after I learned how to grow evaporate gallium arsenide from uh, John Arthur, as you know, as he mentioned before, 
everything made out of glass. We have good glass blowers. We put gallimars and even ga glass capsules try to evaporate from that gas thing. And then uh, a lot of people ask me, what is this K cell you talk about here now? Buy from the MBE equipment companies. K stands for uh, Lucent cell. Newton was a uh, famous physicist, uh, Martin Newton. And then in surface physics studies, we would like to have uh, evaporation uh, with the con condensed phase equilibrium to its vapor in that uh, enclosure. To do that, the cell, if you want to evaporate, the aperture of the cell, the diameter, had to be smaller than the mean free pass of the vapor in the cell. So therefore, when you calculate, the aperture of the cell is so small, like a pinhole size. Now, when I try to grow MBE with this pinhole size glass capsule uh, to, to grow this layer, and the growth layer is very small growth, growth rate, because growth rate is proportional to the aperture size for the growth. So I forget about nuisance cell evaporation. You know, I'm kind of more engineering brute force to take the aperture off and there's no more nuisance evaporation. I try to open the cell as large as I can. There's no more slits in there. So that's why, but the name remained, K-cells. Now, John mentioned earlier about uh, uh, we use glass system. In fact, when I first joined Bell Lab Laboratory, I had a fortune inherit Lester Germer's glass system. Lester Germer is the one, as you know, to demonstrate that that was a, a, a wave, uh, the eruption is a wave. This very famous no, uh, uh, person, the Davidson Gerber's uh, uh, experiment. So I felt there's a lot of problem. John had described how you have a glass system, how do you change it, you, you, you had to use gold O-rings every time you open it, only use once, a whole gold O-ring, how expensive that is. So I first tried to uh, uh, change the glass system into stainless steel. I want to point out here that this, uh, 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 I did this drawing here uh, in June 28th, uh, 1968. And then on the left hand side is the glass chamber. On the right hand side is the uh, stainless steel uh, cryo panels. And then um, we then uh, sent in for make that chamber. Varian at that time is the manufacturing of chambers and uh, some electrical equipment and so on. But they, they know nothing about what, what MBE is. There's no, didn't even have the term of MBE at that time. So uh, on the top here, you see the date, June 28, I placed order, 1968. And then that chamber uh, cost $2,035. <laughs> and it delivering date, here you couldn't see, I made it big and in red, two to six weeks shipping after receipt of the order. And uh, the engineer at that time, Sign over here, his name is the marketing engineer at Graney. And uh, then I want to show you the chamber arrangement. Here is the front top, look down the, the chamber. This is the stainless steel chamber here now. And then the liqu liquid nitrogen uh, feed uh, shroud in the center and the effusion cells. And of course, the effusion cells and all those, we had made ourselves. No one else, just, you are not so, so spoiled just place the order, the system delivered with cells, guns, everything is in there, just push button, you grow the materials. But those days, we had to make everything. We had to wind the, the, the effusion cells, and then uh, here I bought a, a high electron, uh, uh, high energy electron diffraction gun, and then placed over here, and then diffracted over here. But when I first made the, the, the design, I over-designed. I used a 50 keV electron gun. I thought I could get better diffractions and look at better uh, uh, effect on the surface. But I didn't realize 50 keV produced soft x-rays. So I had to put all the glasses, lead glass, in a diffraction screen. It's a nuisance. So from then on, I uh, then the next generation of MBE, uh, if 
diffraction guns lower down to 5K, 10K. And of course, I'll show you why. The difference of 5K, 10K, there's a difference in the diffraction of uh, um, higher energy ones. Higher e energy ones, the evil sphere, the diameter is smaller. So, so when you have the reciprocal rods there, they can look at higher orders of the uh, reciprocal rods. So you can see more so than the 10 to 5 keV, you only intersect the first order. So anyway, uh, here it shows, I, at that time, in 1968, I was able to buy a commercially available EAI quadruple, quadruple mass spectrometer and uh, from Varian. And uh, I want to show you here is after the system delivered uh, in 1968. I just want to show you, I put on this, I don't wear a suit and tie in going MBE crystals. I put on a suit and tie just for the picture's purpose. And uh, uh, here shows the, uh, the chamber I just ordered. And after five weeks, six weeks, I got delivered. And then, uh, of course, there's no manipulator, sample manipulator. And uh, in the center here, we try to build the sample holders. After we build the sample holders, then we put it on top here and then make the MB system. Oh, OK. Now, let's get serious here. Uh, how was M molecular beam uh, invented? How do you invent something? To me, is A plus B gets C. You, if you, uh, when you applied the knowledge of two different technologies, and then you create a third technology, that's a new thing. You invent a new thing. So for me, after I uh, finished my master's degree in Illinois, I got so tired of working and, and then studying at the same time, I told my advisor, I said, I need to take a break. And uh, he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I just want to have a work. I haven't seen Boston. East Coast of the United States yet. After I landed uh, uh, in the middle of the uh, United States, University of Illinois, uh, I haven't seen East Coast or West Coast. So it's all just, to me, Illinois is just a cornfield. It's, where's, where's everything? So, so he said, ah, I gave you a job. I know friends in Boston. So I got a job at the uh, high voltage engineering subsidiary called Ion Physics Corporation. And over there is to the, uh, at that time, in 1960, we get behind of the Sputnik in, in Russia. So John Kennedy was the president. Everything you put a, a proposal with the word rocket in there, you got contract, you got money. So everything, everybody is doing rockets. And then what we're doing is called ion rocket. The ion beam rocket is, of course, not shooting from Earth to orbit, is this very efficient beams that controls the altitude turnings of the station after it shoot up there, okay? So with that uh, ion propulsion work, I learned on the, is A, is uh, I learned the temperature controllers with the electronic negative feedback systems. You know, like John said, Earlier, when we <coughs> get to Bell Labs there, we, it's very primitive equipment. When I try to evaporate a cell, we have a glass tube cell, wire, uh, a hand wind, a, 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 a heater, and then with a variac over here, it's just heater, higher temperature, lower temperature, just by turning the variac. And, uh, so, so, this, so we have to be more sophisticated. And then I learned there's something that called negative feedback. Uh, with the thermocouple, negative feedback system could control the real temperatures. And then we have liquid nitrogen cooled shroud and the uh, heat shielding for the effusion cells. These rocket cesium ion beams with the effusion cells coming out, this temperature had to be very well controlled. And how do you control the temperature? Besides the negative feedback systems, the cells are surrounded by heat shielding, tendling foil heat shield. And then the low lock sample exchange. Well, with surface physics, what we learn? We learn atomic absorption, desorptions, mass spectrometries, high energy, low energy electron diffractions, ultra high vacuums, and clean surface. Add these two together, we try to grow crystals, now called molecular beam epitaxy. 
Now, this just shows you some of the reports. In 1961, I joined Ion Physics Corporation, and of course, this report is for NASA, National uh, uh, Aeronautical Space uh, something. Uh, administration. administration, yes, <laughs> sorry. We also call it NASA, okay. So in there, the title we have here, I just enlarge it bigger, says Ion Rocket Engine System for Altitude Control and Space Keeping. And after one year, as I mentioned, I went to East Coast, I saw Boston, how nice it is, and, uh, but I haven't seen West Coast. My mother and father all migrated to California. I haven't even seen them. So, so my professor, Chuck Hendry, is very good. He just write a, wrote a letter, and then I got a job at TRW, Redondo Beach. That's the Space Technology Laboratory, TRW. And over there, continue, as I mentioned, everybody worked on rockets. This uh, is continue to do the ion emitter rockets for space stations. And uh, uh, I joined there in 1962 and uh, worked through the report again for NASA report. Uh, by 1964, we wrote this report, authored by me and Hil Hayward Shelton. I want to particularly acknowledge Hayward Shelton taught me everything about how to uh, absorption desorption studies because he was. Uh, MIT PhD from Nottingham. Nottingham is a world famous surface physicist. And uh, uh, he was Nottingham's last student. And there, are, there were Nottingham symposiums every year on surface physics. Uh, so Hayward Shelton taught me everything about surface physics. Uh, and in that report, I just want to show you this picture. This is uh, in the report about cesium ion beam source studied from 1962 to 1964. Notice here, this cesium effusion cells that uh, uh, he shielded by tantalum foil to, to keep the temperature uh, uh, uniform. And then look at this. After I joined Bell Lab, tried to improve the technology of effusions, and then maybe use it for grow crystals. And I designed from the glass capsule to the tandem heat shield effusion cells. Even today, MBE, you can see that cells still similar to the one I had in the uh, uh, first uh, NASA report. And here just shows the effusion cell in operation in the liquid nitrogen cooled shroud. Now, turn back time a little bit again. In the study, I learned uh, with Hayward Shelton, and we had to study adsorption, desorption of atoms on solid surfaces for the CM ion sources. And then uh, the work of uh, 62 to 64, uh, we found it published uh, in Journal Applied Physics in 1966. In that paper, this is direct uh, re reproduction of the paper, figure number one. We have effusion cells here and shutters and molecular beams coming up there through the shutters and then uh, uh, hitting on the substrate. The desorption from the substrate is ionized going to a portable mass spectrometer. This is in 1962, as you know. There is no commercially available portable mass spectrometer in 1962. I had to study and read in German, a German thesis by Kahn, try to understand his, how quadruple mass spectrometer works. We built ourselves this quadruple mass spectrometer with electronics, and then uh, we do the measurement. And of course, uh, five years later, like 1967, this become commercially available. In that, John Arthur alluded earlier, when you open, close the shutter, we, we see the exponential curve on and off. And then uh, by looking at the lifetime of that, you plot the Arrhenius plot. You get the activation energy of uh, this 
molecules on the surface. I went back, finally, my professor came to TRW, told me in 1965, uh, uh, Al Cho, if you don't come back to Illinois, you're fired. You're no longer uh, can be a, a, a PhD candidate anymore. I said, yes, sir. In, 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 in 1965, I dropped immediately everything. I was going to be uh, uh, Beach Boy and Redondo Beach, but now the, la the, the, the whole dream shattered. And then in, in, in February 65, I hopped on the car, drove to the snowy uh, Middle West, Illinois, and checking uh, the dormitory there. And of course, five years gone, from 61 to 65, everything changed. At that time, we, we don't, if, when I left there, there's no qualifying exam for PhDs. When I go back there, there's a qualifying exam. <laughs> and where it worse yet, the electronics changing from vacuum tubes to solid state electronics. I had no idea what's in my conductories. I had a, I had a qualifying exam. I'll or fall flat. But my professor is so nice. I owe all my success by Professor C.D. Hendricks. He said, don't worry. First semester, just sit in the class, learn semiconductor, and then you can take the qualifying exam. I, was, I never worked so hard in my life. You know, day and night, weekend, I don't care. There's no more anything, uh, just study. You, you remember when you go to class, you, you, you're, you're doing good that you, you do the chapter in the back, uh, odd, odd numbers or even numbers. In the, I go from number one to number last. Every uh, uh, question in each book, I study. I, I made it. So I, I passed the qualifying exam. There were 31 person took 11 people passed, and I was number two. So I was doing well. So in that thesis, I finally wrote, I was, of course, had an advantage. I was doing that work, surface physics work in TRW. <coughs> I just extend that as my thesis. So in my thesis, I plot, I define the condensations or sticking coefficient equal to S, uh, is S equal to one minus A over B. A is the, when you open the shutter, abrupt change up to A and then the exponential equilibrium to the value of B. Look at the ex two extremes here. If A equal to uh, B, then that sticking coefficient is one minus one, zero. That, there's no atom absorbed on the surface. The other extreme, if A equal to zero, then the sticking coefficient S is equal to unity, one. That means every atom you hit it on the surface, sticks. You go around there. Therefore, uh, and of course, in between, there uh, can be fractional of the thing uh, uh, absorbed in, in 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.0. Now, with this, John Arthur made the most important study of the surface physics in absorption, desorption work. Notice here that when this is showing here the arsenic atom coming out of the surface when you open the shutter, as long as you have time with that curve here. Abrupt change go up there. That means A is not zero, okay? It, they don't, the, all the arsenic atom didn't stick on the surface. And on and off, he shuddered. The important thing here, when you get it here, you turn on the gallium beam on the surface. You have a gallium covered gallium arsenic surface. Now, when you open the shutter, look at here. Exponential curve start from the beginning. There's no abrupt increase there. That means A equals zero. S unity sting coefficient. So that's what makes us know. You want to grow gallium arsenide? If you, you can plaster the, plaster the surface with arsenic, doesn't matter. They were just bouncing out of the surface, first surface. So as long as you have enough arsenic on the surface, you got any, on the surface, you go get arsenic. And Tom Fox and Bruce Joyce did also the experiment that he's plotting here is 
uh, sticking coefficient of arsenic as a function of gallium beam arrival rate. Again, when the gallium beam arrives with more, the sticking coefficient of arsenic increases more. That was published in 1977. I want to show you a little bit about I actually bought the heat system. Very, very expensive. Here is the 1968 when I first get to Bell Lab. You know, you, they give you an empty room. That's so exciting in Bell Labs. After you come out of school, you go in and check in Bell Labs, empty room, a table, a paper pad and pencil, start, sky's the limit, and you go where you want to go. And then, of course, the other thing I, I was lucky to have uh, John Osser sort of coaching me, oh, this is good, what is it? Oh, we grow gallium arsenic. So I had an idea, you know, of course, we try to grow things that she was telling you earlier. The first one we try to grow diamond for that, because on the other hand, when we try to evaporate graphite, is is graphite come out is chained C7. When it hit on the surface here, it's still C7. Therefore, it's it's uh, it's it's, it's uh, uh, you grow a graphite film on there. You don't grow diamond. So anyway, I just uh, in in Bell Labs here, uh, you can have a first dose of uh, uh, money that uh, what you want to do your experiment, you buy equipment. So after I spent uh, $3,000, I bought, made the chamber, I want to have heat gun. But the heat gun is very expensive. Five, a 50 kV gun I, I ordered, $41,000. Oh, that was absolutely, it was like oh, unbelievable expensive, okay? Uh, where compared with the chamber, I said down here, bottom here, is only $2,035 where the gun's going to mount it in there. So anyway, I bought it. Uh, John Gall was good enough. He hired me. He figured, well, give this guy a chance. See what he can do. You know, even $41,000. He signed it. And then, uh, but you see, this gun gave me a really important wrote how to grow films. It was a great surprise to observe the surface structure changes as a function of substrate temperature and the relative fluxes of arsenic and gallium in, uh, incident on the gallium arsenide surface. I interpret the conversion of surface structures is due to surface composition changes. And later I use that surface composition changes plot the surface phase diagram. But when I first presented this reconstruction of surface structures in 1970, I met tremendous oppositions of resistance from the surface physics community. And at that time, the surface physics, all this community considered this surface structure is due to the impurity surface sitting on the clean surface. For instance, oxygen on nickel 100 surface produce a center two by two surface structure, published by Al McRae, very famous surface physicist in Bell Labs in surface science in 1964. Now, surface structure, I was so excited that I found gallium stabilized surface structure, square 19, arsenic stabilized surface structure, two by two, on the bar one, bar one, bar one, gallium arsenic surface. But I forgot to ask myself, after all this work, when you get the result, anybody cares? Well, the answer is, maybe only three people care in the whole world. Well, anyway, I did publish that result uh, in Journal of Applied Physics coming out in 1970. Why did you like it? No one cared because the industry only used 001 gallium arsenide substrates. They don't care about bar one, bar one, bar one surface. So from then on, I immediately uh, changed to study on the bar one, bar, uh, one, 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 zero, zero, one surface. And of course, I mentioned earlier a little bit is I, when, I, when I look at the square nine, uh, that was on the one, one, one surface, on the one, uh, zero, zero, one surface, I saw center eight by two, center two by eight surface uh, when I use a 50 keV gun. If I lower the the gun to 10 to 5 ke, I see two by four by structures, which you all see today. That's this arsenic to gallium uh, stabilized surface structure. 
Now, in the same year, 1971, I also uh, 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 reported the diffraction pattern on the right-hand side, and then the corresponding surface structure. Look at the carbon replica on the left-hand side. When you have a gallium arsenide surface, when you clean with bromine methanol, and then you think it's very clean, you put in the MBE system, heat it up, uh, dissolve the oxide, what happened? You look at diffraction patterns, spotty diffractions. The reason is because after it heated up, they have microfaceting. The surface is, has little tiny hills and valleys. The electron beam, diffraction beam, coming on the surface with a grazing angle, had to penetrate through the protuberances on the surface. Three-dimensional Lowry condition has to be satisfied. Three-dimensional Lowry condition gives you spot diffraction in the reciprocal space. Now, when I grow with MBE on the surface, it forming larger, smoother areas. And you see here, the second one, the diffraction pattern getting a little bit more streaky. Right? And then finally, it gets so smooth, atomically smooth, the diffraction pattern becomes strictly present. Why? Because two-dimensional Lowry conditions are reciprocal rods. The evil sphere intersect the reciprocal rods at the at zero point here are lines. Furthermore, when we get so smooth, you see the fractional one-half order showing in the 110 azimuth direction. That shows the atom in the 110 azimuth are two times larger than the bulk crystal in real space. So with that, I find out if you, use, if you get uh, different arsenic to gallium ratio, different substrate temperatures, I therefore plot the arsenic to gallium ratio in the vertical scale and 1,000 over degree K on the uh, horizontal scale. I plot their arsenic stabilized surface structure and then gallium stabilized surface structure on the left-hand corner. As you all know, today, when we grow shiny smooth surfaces, we always want to try to grow an arsenic stabilized surface structure. Why? It's just like John Arthur really showed that any an, a, a, additional arsenic atom, they just bounce off anyway. Doesn't matter. So, so as long as you have enough arsenic atom on the surface, you grow shiny gallium arsenic surface. But too much gallium on the surface, what happens? You got gallium bees on the surface. You got a hazy surface, a finish. Okay? So therefore, we always grow on the arsenic stabilized surface structure. Term, the term molecular beam epitaxy. Thank you for more panish. That that was the first time we used in his in the talk uh, the symposium, international symposium on gallium arsenide and related compounds held in Aachen, Germany. More presented the talk, but I stay back in the United States, keep on working. You know, he was my first. Uh, he was my uh, new department head, as I said. That uh, Jeffrey Garrett moved out, and then more panish become my new department head. And then uh, here is the, the paper. The paper says, the title says, Molecular Beam Epitaxy of Gallium Arsenide, Aluminum Gallium Arsenide, and uh, Gallium Phosphide. Author is Cho, Panish, and Hayashi. So that was the first time MBE, the term, was used. Super lattices. The proposal by Leo Isaki and Ray Zhu that uh, uh, on the negative differential conductivity in super lattices open a new dimension. And uh, uh, that would not be possible in uh, bulk semiconductors now appear to become possible in super lattice structures. They published in IBM Journal Research and Development in 1970. I saw that paper, I immediately demonstrate MBE superlattice structures. Here in 1971, applied physics letter, I showed with MBE, easy to make superlattice structures. As you know, superlattice structures <coughs> depend on what compound you make the superlattice structures. These band alignment are different. You can align in type one, type two, type three different alignments. One is you can have electron holes in the low band gap materials layer, or the electron in the low band gap material, the, the hole in the high band gap material. 
or they are mixing, depending on you're growing gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide superlattice structures, or Indian gallium arsenide, gallium and timonite arsenide, depending on what compound you want to use. Here now, with time limit, I want to continue to introduce you MBE grows of single crystal metal. We grow single crystal aluminum on gallium arsenide. And then with that, we made micro shocky diodes, which has extremely low noise temperature. At that time, this single crystal shocky diode was applied for application in uh, radio astronomy at that time. MBE contribution to uh, the basic research is also quite extensive. For instance, the growth of high purity gallium uh, sem semiconductor layers for Stromer, Densui, discovered fractional quantum Hall effect. And then the growth of superstructures of metal layers, Furt and Grunberg discovered the giant magneto resistance. Nobel Prizes were awarded for both of these discoveries. In 1970, the start of MBE device applications, I know that only after we could demonstrate new devices and new applications, we can change the world. But the first demonstration I tried to show is to grow a double hydrogen injection laser because more Panish and Hayashi just demonstrated with liquid phase epitaxy, world first semiconductor laser, lasing room temperature CW. I want to do that. But when I try to do that, not only not even laser, didn't have any light coming out of there. Fall on my face. Go back to the drawing board. Now, Hayashi was constantly monitoring my layers luminescence, photonic measurements. That uh, he finds that there's days are good, there are days not good. Said, what did you do? And I, I said, I didn't do anything. I had to go the same way. But then I, I finally look at all my data. I analyzed. Hey, during summertime, my luminescence of aluminum gallium arsenide is horrible. During wintertime, are pretty good. Why? Because in New Jersey, summertime humidity very high. When I, every time I open the system to change my substrate, the whole chamber is water vapor condensed in there. And you know, I couldn't grow reactive aluminum gallium arsenide. So I therefore said, ah. from the earlier days of low lock studies in, in the ion propulsion work, I'm going to put a low lock in there. So with the help of Paul Lucier here, Varian, uh, early days, all my chamber were made by Varian. And uh, then uh, uh, Paul Lucier especially helped me a lot in designing the liquid nitrogen cool shroud here. At that time, I didn't know they had a skill can wrap around a effusion cell with liquid nitrogen. Uh, they can weld so well. But Paul Lucier knows, you know, he's from Varian. And uh, so we have the liquid nitrogen cool shroud completely surrounding the growth chamber. I mean, diffusion cells. And then here's the big bellow. Well, what I did is I had that sample mount in the, in the center here, uh, uh, that rod here. We finished first pull, pull out this to the end. The gate valve is closed. We mount a new sample in there. After the pumping with ex auxiliary ion pump over here, then when we pump down to 10 to minus 7 or whatever, and then we open the gate valve, inserting this big bellow rod. It's really very ugly to send it to the center there for the growth. The problem is, while you're growing, you cannot close the gate valve because the big bellow, this rod, is in the way. So we had to grow with that bellow exposed to the growth chamber. As you know, bellow had a lot of surface area, absorbed all the contaminated air and water. And uh, uh, even pump down 10 se 9 to 7 was better than open up to, to, to air every time you open uh, changing the sample. But it's improved, but not ideal. So we go on to the next generation. First of all, I want to show you. I actually had the system pictures here. The top part of he here is the uh, 1970 MBE chambers. By the 1975, we're putting this, uh, uh, this uh, bellow uh, uh, things here. This is the, the red here is a auxiliary uh, pumping here, 
But you can see this is half moon looking. Why is half moon? Because the bellow cannot go that far. We had to cut down the round chamber into half moon so that the, 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 the bellow can reach to the center for the growth. We need to have a better design. So I would keep on trying to see how we can absolutely isolate the growth chamber from the low lock. It was a very good engineer. His name is Buisson in Ribeir. And he helped me. To, to, he introduced this so-called magnetic coupled transfer rod. So what I can do now, I mount a sample on this magnetic uh, transfer rod, and then open the gate valve, inserting the sample into this manipulator here on a molybdenum block, rotate, clock, put on the, this, this holder here. And then I retract the, this, this rod back into the low lock system, close the gate valve. So now I have completely isolation of the growth chamber and the low lock when we mount the new sample in here. From there on, of course, I have the best uh, uh, vacuum for the growth. I just want to show you a little bit, Jim Harris earlier alluded a little bit how I first tried to do the majority care device. Why? After I first show you, I fall on my face. I tried to follow more panish liquid phase appetizer. You grow a laser. I couldn't make a laser. I have very good collaborators in Bell Labs. I told you earlier, what makes a place is the people in the place. In Bell Labs, they not only have experts in every field, they have five experts in every field. So I can always find a, a good collaborator which I can talk to, I can work with. If you have a, even have an expert, if you have very bad personality, you don't want to work with it, you can work with the next guy. So I, I was so lucky to work in the place. I have so many talented people. Now, I have Franz Reinhardt across the hall from me. Franz Reinhardt said, oh, well, don't get too depressed when you couldn't make the, that laser. It's not the end of the world. You try to demonstrate what MBE can do, LPE cannot do. What? He said, well, MBE can grow doping profiles any way you want to dope. You can dope exponential curve doping profile. You can grow low, high, low, abruptly, changing within monolayers, changing the doping profile. No one other crystal growth technology can do. And so you, you couldn't make the, the laser to laser, and let's do something with majority carrier devices, just electrons. So what I did is first, so in 1974, that demonstrated the first MBE microwave device called the Gallimard's knife voltage varactor that have a doping profile in the voltage varactor is exponentially increased. Uh, wh what that does is the, the capacitance changes linearly with the bias voltage. Right? Very important for all your TV tunings or all these uh, applications. Now the network, uh, the second one is the first MBE impact diode. The impact diode is at that time dying to have some doping profiles called low, high, low impact diodes that no one can, can do, MB demonstrate. So that was actually used in the first test of microwave tubes in Washington. But then after we did that, the uh, changing from microwave transmission to optical transmission. So therefore we went on to continue to do laser work rather than microwave transmission. So then uh, I mentioned we introduced uh, uh, low lock exchange in 75, and then very importantly, by 1976, I demonstrated the first MBE double hydro injection laser, lasing CW at room temperature. If you can do that, you almost practically can do any other devices, because it's most critical to make that CW room temperature lasers. And then uh, continue to develop MBE. By 1980, we go into long wavelengths uh, with Norman Chan uh, in my lab. They're growing uh, Indian compound materials. And then 
we need to have more uniform growth. With Norman Chen was in my lab, we demonstrate the first rotating MBE substrate holders to get more uniform growth. And then we'll continue to make uh, the 1.55 micron aluminum gallium arsenide uh, double hydro injection lasers, these room temperature. I just want to show you this view graph. This is the milestone that demonstrated MBE can make room temperature CW laser. That was published uh, in the applied physics letter in 1976. The road from basic research to production, it is a long road. I just want you to have some feeling for it. For crystal growers like us, we first grow a layer, we look at the surface morphology, take a picture with a Namaski camera, and then we publish paper. And then next difficulty is the crystallinity of the, the, the structure. Are, are you polished crystalline? Are you a single crystal? Is there defects in there? And then next level up is transport properties. After you grow a crystal, you measure mobilities. The mobility can be terrible because of traps and all the other things in there. You had to grow very high quality materials purity to grow high mobility devices. And of course, next, gener next level higher is look at the photoluminescence. Now you look at the minority care device. It's harder yet. And then you can make PN junctions. Hard PN junctions is not come easy is you have to have interface very smooth and doping profile, abrupt changes to get good PN junctions. After you did all that, Aha, I can start making devices. So you make a device, you can publish a paper. But then, the important thing is, you can't just make a device which the last 10 minutes, get the data and publish a paper. You gotta have make a device which will last 10 years and 20 years to be any useful. So even worse yet, after I finally make it to have a high reliability devices, and then the, the manager comes here and says, is it cost effective? You cannot make a laser $5,000 and then try to make it people uh, using the CD players. Who wants $5,000 for, for a CD player lasers, right? So I find in order to reduce the cost, we need large volume production. But it is extremely difficult to convince MBE equipment companies to make the first production MBE system. I remember clearly, in the 1980s, I went to Rebeer and uh, you know, here you know, I help you make the, the first MBE, international MBE conference, and, and then uh, I was working very closely with Mr. Buisson, and then here Buisson was there also. And uh, I tried to convince uh, the president of Rebeer to make a MBE production system. He said, oh, okay, um, what are you gonna use for? I said, uh, lasers. And there's a, how many lasers you need a year? I try to stretch my memory, oh, a million, two million. And, uh, and, uh, and then he said, oh, well, well, what are you, what other thing you want? I said, microwave devices. Well, how many you want to make? Oh, at that time, we don't, we don't have cell phone yet. I said, oh, another million, another two million. And then, he make an envelope calculation. Oh, you only need one production MBE system for the whole world. <laughs> that was the end of our conversation, you see? It was, oh, forget it. I, mean, I spent all that money making the system. I can only make, uh, make one production system for the whole world. I'm not going to make it. So I had to use tremendous pressure uh, convincing them, saying, if you have the equipment, people will find use for that. We'll get more applications. You know, more people are going to buy it. And then, of course, with that comes, I, and then I went back to Dr. Gilbert Hyatt, who, who was the owner of, of Rivera, and I said, oh, we can develop the next generation. You have to have a little bit of vision what the future is going to be. So with the pressure from the owner, from the other things, everything, finally, Rivera launched the world first MBE production system in 1988. Here's one of the systems. You can see why he didn't want to do it if you only sell one. 
spend all that money, put the software in there, automations in there, you put a wafer in there, uh, push a button, you, c you come out the other side, the gross layer, okay? Uh, you can see that you have pattern on there, mounting many wafers on there. Put in the cassette, in the cassette, you one by one transfer into the gross chamber, okay? Now, this MBE production system, very uniform, the uniformity of the thickness is 0.5% across the wafer. And then, uh, very stable. The most important I want to show you is that very high uptime, 95, 94% uptime. The run is you can have six to nine months time of running before you open the MBE system. It runs seven days a week, 24 hours a day. That continuous running, you can run six to nine months without opening the system. And then large platen, these days you can have 25 three-inch wafer mounting on each platen. And then you can mount seven six-inch gallon of wafers on each platen. Furthermore, the changing time from platen to platen it only takes two minutes. Now, this is extremely important for, as you know, our competitor, uh, MOCBD, is constantly eating our lunch there, that they, uh, the changing of platinum to platinum in MOCBD is a lot longer. And of course, there are many other advantages of MBE versus MOCBD that, uh, of course, they have also their advantage over MBE also uh, uh, is another uh, topic that we can talk about. Here, I just want to show you, a lot of people think MBE is not for mass production. But the micro uh, device, RF, uh, MD, and now IQE uh, that uh, uh, Amy is here, that uh, uh, they produce 500 million chips per year. As you know, in the United States, only 200 million people. Now, we supply across the world of this uh, uh, MBE grown Gallium uh, amplifiers, RF switchings. Every cell phone has four RF switchings in there. They're all made by MBE. Now I want to move on to give you a little bit uh, a talk about the future. And uh, in semiconductor optical sources, the, the, the here plotting the wavelengths, one meter to 0.1 micrometer. The green area shows electronic devices can cover that frequency. The yellow part shows the semiconductor lasers can cover that range. And then there's a blue area in the middle, big gap. The, the mid-infrared range from that uh, 300 microns to 3 microns range, God didn't give us the material, we'll have the band gap to give us that wavelength. And of course, you saw in here middle, 10 terahertz is in the, right here. We talk about terahertz, future of electronics. It's also in this range. Why this infrared range is important? Because most of molecular vibrational, uh, molecular vibrational energy, that frequency is in that mid-infrared. So in Bell Labs, we invented the quantum cascade laser, which is a completely new laser. It's only used one, one kind of carrier, electrons, no holes just electrons that can, in the, in the uh, inter sub -end transition, that uh, give out light. In 1994, we published the first quantum cascade laser in that uh, science magazine. Okay, uh, here is the team we have. It's truly international team. Here, the first one on the left-hand side is Federal Capasso. He's my longtime collaborator. And then me in the second one in white shirt. And the third one, uh, Al Hutchinson, is the lab assistant of Federico Capasso. And then Debbie Sifko is my lab assistant in MBE Crystal Girls. Then these two are the postdocs. The Jerome Face is a postdoc from Switzerland. And then Carlos Sakura is the postdoc from Italy. So it's, it's in Bell Lab, it's, it's attract the world's
best people. Doesn't matter what race, what gender, where you come from, what your habit of doing research, as long as you're good. I think that's what makes Bell Labs Bell Labs. Now, quantum cascade laser application can be used for industrial process controls, the medical diagnostic for ulcers, liver disease, kidney malfunctions, asthma, so, uh, asthmas, and then uh, for uh, uh, domestic security, military detecting explosive narcotic biological warfares and the terahertz devices. And then it's na now manufacturing, you can buy the quantum cascade laser equipment. And then in California, this company uh, called that uh, Paranatica, and uh, uh, you can buy quantum cascade laser uh, equipment, three watt output, 20 watts output CW, room temperature. So in summary, MBE is broadly used today for devices, nano uh, multi-layer structure productions, and uh, uh, radically new devices including quantum cascade lasers, uh, high-speed transistors, microwave devices, uh, microjunction solar cells, uh, laser uh, diodes and detectors. Most of today's semiconductor lasers using uh, compact disc players, CDs, ROMs, are all manufactured by MBE materials. MBE is also used in fabricating the RF switches and power amplifiers used in every day of our mobile phone today. That Russia gave us the MBE, the first international nanotechnology prize, the Rus Nano Prize in 2009. I want to thank you, all my fellow MBE workers, that I was so fortunate to work with most many outstanding scientists and engineers. Many of you are here today. And uh, when I think about what in my career, what the most important aspect of all, that was working with a team of most capable people and having mutual trust and mutual respect. That is the most important for our success. Thank you very much. Next speaker is uh, Tom Foxen, uh, who will provide a perspective on the development of uh, MB in uh, the UK and Europe. Uh, Tom earned his BS degree in physics at King's College in London and uh, PhD in material science at uh, Battersea College, uh, London University. He first served as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Surrey and then uh, went to the University of Alberta and uh, then joined the Phillips Research Laboratory in Red Hill. Uh, Tom developed one of the key things is modulation beam mass spectrometry that became one of the key techniques for the basic study of the chemistry on the MBE growth process. This provided a foundation for the growth of extraordinarily pure material and uh, ultra high mobility 2D ga electron gas structures where they, uh, he and collaborators observed the quantum quantized conduction and point contacts, measurement of charge of the quasi-particles in the fractional quantum Hall effect. As a result of his pioneering work on these ultra-high mobility structures, he was uh, both a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Nottingham, but also a visiting professor of physics at the Technical University of Eindhoven, where he could continue his collaboration with the uh, Phillips Eindhoven group. Uh, and I've forgotten the Henk, uh, the guy that did a lot of the uh, 2D Hank gas. Hank Van Hank Van Halpen. Yeah. Um, so over the years, Tom has worked on a, a great variety of uh, uh, different materials. He's a fellow of the Royal Society and the recipient of the first uh, Al Cho MBE award, which I had the great distinction of uh, presenting. I was the chair of the MBE committee at that time, and uh, it was a uh, 
in Edinburgh, and so those of you who were there remember I wore my uh, kilt for the first time. Uh, it uh, returned to Scotland to its original home. So with that, uh, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> okay, so I, I want to speak about the history, really, of um, uh, MBE uh, at, um, uh, at um, MRL, uh, MRL, as they were, Mullard Research Laboratories. Uh, in the beginning, it, it later became uh, uh, PRL, uh, Phillips Research Laboratories. Uh, and then finally, um, I moved with uh, my colleague, as we'll see, uh, to Nottingham in um, around about uh, 1991. And I'll explain why. Um, it's a salutary lesson, I think. OK, um, so the, the, the project started, um, uh, again, um, uh, when I met Bruce Joyce and Jim Neve, uh, who'd moved to uh, MRL shortly before I came there. They'd previously uh, been working at, um, uh, at Plessy. Um, and it actually started, um, the project started, uh, as we'll see in a moment, um, in February 1970. Uh, the reason was nothing to do with growing layers. Um, the reason was that um, uh, Philip uh, Mallards had a problem with their gun diodes. Um, and the idea uh, of this project was simply to use this modulated uh, beam mass spectrometry to study uh, gallium oxide and to see what was going wrong with their uh, production uh, process. Um, life didn't work out uh, quite that way, um, but we'll see why in a minute. Um, our first publications were um, a little bit later than those um, uh, from Bell in about 1973, um, and that work continued until we moved um, I must say, not voluntarily, um, <laughs> to uh, Nottingham um, to, to do the work there. Okay, before getting on to um, what happened um, at, um, at Mullard's, um, there was work earlier uh, at Plessy um, by uh, Bruce and his collaborator Bob Bradley, um, where they were growing uh, silicon uh, from silane uh, in a UHV system, fully uh, developed UHV system with. Um, uh, diffusion pumps, something you wouldn't see on an MBE system these days, but they're actually very efficient uh, for pumping uh, gases. Um, and in fact, um, you can handle with a diffusion pump things that you can't handle uh, as easily with other pumping systems. Um, the the uh, beam was formed uh, and then impinged here on the heated target. So this was, um, from my point of view, a very early uh, example of um, growth from a molecular beam uh, to produce um, uh, a semiconductor uh, film. So here you can see um, uh, silicon uh, islands grown on the silicon substrate. They're clearly epitaxial, uh, as you can see from this picture. So this is uh, long before um, we were working at, um, uh, at Mullard's. Well, coming back to uh, Mullard's, um, the project, uh, as you'll see, um, was conceived in um, October uh, 1969. Um, and for a curious reason, you see uh, only my name there. Um, the reason is that at uh, Mars at that time, if you had a project, which Bruce did, uh, you couldn't have a second project. Um, so curiously, Bruce's name doesn't appear here. Um, but it really was a collaboration between uh, all of us. Um, you can see the budget cost for it, uh, 4,000 pounds, wow. Um, and 12,000 pounds in a later year. Um, and the probability of getting a contract for this, zero. <laughs> but, um, okay, so um, th this was the, the first um, system that we put together. Jim Neve here, uh, he, he, uh, everybody should um, remember Jim's name. Um, he was actually vital uh, to all of this work. Um, he was the guy who had the experience with um, ultra-high vacuum equipment. And Jim's contribution cannot be underestimated. Um, so you see in this in the first system, we have um, the molecular beam source. I'll show you in a moment. It was modulated by a, an in-situ uh, rotating uh, motor, uh, fairly unique. Uh, Ferranti made this UHV motor, which you could buy. Um, and uh, that allowed the uh, molecular beam to impinge on the substrate. And the desorbed beam could also be modulated by a second motor. Um, and the mass spectrometer was situated here in a liquid nitrogen cooled region so that it was a first pass 
through there, and anything that went through was uh, frozen on the um, uh, on there. And we had a second molecular beam source here to just look at what comes from the um, source itself. Um, okay. Um, shortly after that, um, this system was modified uh, because of the work that was going on at both I uh, at Bell and IBM. Um, and in fact, uh, we used the electron gun from the uh, OJ system cylindrical mi mirror analyzer here uh, to provide um, a read pattern uh, on the surface and um, introduced a, a vacuum interlock um, even at that very early stage. Um, but other than that, um, it was essentially the same uh, uh, system. Okay, what did it look like? Uh, a bit of a mess, really. <laughs> um, but you can see uh, the, the chamber itself, a huge iron pump here. Mullards actually made their own UHV uh, materials. And this Mullard iron pump, 500 liters per second, uh, still exists somewhere at Nottingham. I, I haven't found it recently, but it still is there. Um, and you can see the pumping, uh, the two absorption pumps. Um, it was computer controlled. Um, there was a guy called um, uh, uh, Boudry who walked in from Australia and he was a, a, um, a really good um, electrical engineer um, and he put together uh, a system um, uh, of uh, a computer interface here in the very early days. The computer had 4K of memory. <laughs> okay? And that computer managed to run the whole uh, MBE system. It's amazing. Um, but there you go. Okay. Um, so looking at it in a bit more detail, uh, you can see the, um, the, the various components, the, the OJ system here. Um, this is the version two with the read screen here. Um, the manipulator, sample manipulator on, on the top. Uh, we had four uh, Knudsen cells um, with their independent shutters uh, and the mass spectrometer. Uh, that still exists in my lab in Nottingham and it still works after all of this time, amazingly. Um, the cells were homemade, as Al said. Um, just look at the dimension here, one millimeter. These were not exactly large cells. <laughs> uh, they were, nevertheless, true Knudsen cells. Um, you can see that the internal surface area here is very large compared with the, the um, size of the aperture. That's a second requirement for a Knudsen cell. Um, and what we paid attention to was making sure we measured the temperature accurately. So there's um, the thermocouple uh, welded to uh, a plate here, so it really does measure accurately the substrate, uh, the sa uh, source temperature. Okay, um, things moved on. Um, slightly um, large, uh, sorry, big bottom. Um, go back one. Uh, so slightly um, uh, larger cells here with uh, larger capacity, but again, still uh, a true Knudsen cell uh, rather than the modern uh, cells that we um, that we use it, uh, which really ought to be called Langmuir cells because um, it's Langmuir evaporation, uh, but it never caught on. Um, okay, so all of that um, led to um, the uh, development of the um, models uh, for um, uh, growth of um, uh, gallium arsenide. Essentially, um, this one reproduced what John Arthur had done uh, earlier, um, showing that the sticking coefficient of arsenic um, was one. It's more complicated with the tetramer, um, and it's a much more um, uh, elaborate surface uh, reaction here. It's a second order reaction. Um, Bruce was in his element with this. Um, he was a chemist by training. He was only ever interested in MBE as a route to understanding um, uh, chemistry. Uh, that was his uh, forte. Um, we went on to look at um, mixed group three, uh, elements and mixed group five elements. Um, so we covered pretty well the, uh, the, the range of um, three fives. Um, one of the most important things um, uh, uh, that came out of the work um, at um, um, Mars was this observation here. Um, not my work, uh, that of um, uh, Jeff Harris um, and um, Bruce Joyce. Other people had previously seen oscillations in the in, in the read, uh, in fact, um, John here describes it one in one beautifully in one of his review papers. Um, the key thing here, however, um, what um, what uh, um, Jeff realised uh, was that the frequency of these oscillations corresponded exactly uh, to the um, 
uh, deposition rate in monolase per second, which proved uh, that the read oscillation was associated uh, with, um, uh, with growing um, uh, monolase of material. This uh, picture here, uh, which appears in many, many papers, uh, was actually drawn up not for scientific reasons, it was drawn up to explain to the management how read oscillations work. <laughs> So this, uh, and in fact, this, this still exists in my office in, um, in Nottingham. Anybody who wants to see the original can come to Nottingham and see it. Yeah. It's there. Um, in colour. Yeah. The, 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 the published ones are in black and white, of course. Yeah. But the colour version is in my office. You're, you're welcome to see it. Um, okay, um, so then um, we developed, uh, of course, again with the help of Jim Nee, um, the... Um, uh, the, the, the various cells, in, including this first arsenic cracker, um, which uh, was developed very early on um, at, uh, uh, with Jim's expertise, and of course um, uh, cells for um, uh, doping and cells for um, growing, uh, seriously growing material. This is the first um, uh, homemade system um, uh, for the gr for real film growth uh, at Nottingham. Um, Colin Wood was involved at this stage and um, uh, John Roberts, uh, who subsequently deserted to grow by MOVPE. Um, so uh, he, he went to Sheffield to, to do that work. Um, this was the first commercial system we achieved. A very young uh, Jeff Harris here um, uh, operating that, uh, that system. Um, it actually was used to supply um, 35 gigahertz mixer diodes to Marlars at Hazel Grove. In um, uh, as early as 1982, they were sold on the market. So this may represent one of the earliest, first um, commercial uh, uh, uses of MBE um, for um, for actual devices that were sold uh, to the public. Um, and it's little known, I think, outside uh, Israel. Then, um, in um, uh, 1985, we got the uh, the second commercial system. This is a Varian Gen 2 with this curious uh, system for introducing samples here with an OSIUS system built into it. Um, and that operated from um, uh, the first layer was grown as, as you can see here in January um, 1985. In, in the UK we don't have this curious example of putting the, uh, the month first. Um, so things are slightly different. And it ran, it grew a total of 950 layers um, and it ran until they kicked me out in 1991. Um, so it was a very um, successful um, piece of kit. Um, uh, we were involved in lots of um, races of one sort or another. Uh, the race really um, that, uh, that was really um, uh, interesting was to provide the highest mobility two-dimensional electron gas uh, possible. Um, and various people contributed. It was a truly international effort. Um, uh, there were, there were uh, breakthroughs in uh, Germany, uh, in, um, uh, in Japan, uh, and of course in the uh, USA, uh, as, as well as in uh, the UK. Our best ever sample uh, here, uh, G635, grown in 1989, uh, had an extrapolated mobility uh, of uh, 1.2 by 10 to the 7. That's cheating, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. Um, but in fact, uh, Lauren Pfeiffer, um, wh whom I'm grateful for this slide, uh, was the first person to actually achieve uh, 10 to the 7 at uh, 1 um, uh, Kelvin. Uh, nevertheless, we, we got pretty close. Maybe we got the silver medal or something, I don't know. Um, uh, and again, um, w there was a great um, uh, contest. Uh, this was a UK contest, actually, um, looking at uh, this business of uh, quantized uh, conduction uh, in point contacts. Um, and contrary to what most people think, um, the guys at the Cavendish um, actually um, uh, published the first paper on this. It was received in January uh, 1988. Uh, ours was actually received uh, a little bit later, two months later. Um, but uh, unlike the guys in, 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 um, in Cambridge, uh, we, we, um, we called it um, quantized conduction. That's better than resistance, isn't it, after all? It's different. But uh, there you go. Um, so uh, what I want to 
say finally is um, uh, John Orton, who, who's an absolutely um, uh, splendid person. I, I went to um, work with him at, um, at Nottingham. Uh, he writes beautifully. Um, and he and I are collaborating on what we hope will be uh, an unbiased uh, history uh, of MBE. Um, it'll come out um, sometime um, uh, early next year. Um, and um, hopefully this will um, uh, put some of these stories into, in, into the literature. Okay, what I finally want to say is that um, things are still moving. Um, why did we move to Nottingham in, um, in, in 1991? Well, um, it was because um, the Phillips decided there was absolutely no future for the nitrites. Um, they, were, they, they were dead. They were, they were, you couldn't dope them P-type. Um, so um, that was the end of MBE at, 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 um, at Phillips for that reason. So we moved um, to, um, to Nottingham. And the original intention was to grow aluminum gallium arsenide nitride as a wide band gap semiconductor because that's what the theories told us at the time. Um, of course, it didn't, ah, sorry, big one. Um, it didn't work out like that um, because, again, um, being an international effort, uh, experiments in Japan show that if you put nitrogen into our gas, it actually narrows the gap. Um, so that, that idea was dead. Um, so then we went on to look at um, uh, aluminum gallium nitride on sapphire by plasma MBE. Um, and um, do that work um, for quite some considerable time. Um, curiously, um, one of my colleagues here, Sergei, who's somewhere in the audience with all the hair, um, he, he has been very patient um, in growing um, aluminum gallium nitride substrates by MBE. It takes hundreds of hours, um, but you can do something unique with MBE that you can't do with any other technique. You can actually grow uh, mixed aluminum gallium nitride of any competition. Um, uh, and that's led also to um, the work on highly mismatched alloys with collaborators uh, here in the USA and back in uh, Huey. Around about um, 2001, uh, we started the work on spintronics. And um, Richard is also here somewhere in the, in the audience. Um, most recently, um, the, the gallium manganese arsenide, um, we managed to get to about 200 Kelvin with a combination of um, careful growth uh, and in situ annealing studies. But there's no way that we're going to get to um, uh, room temperature. But this new material, copper manganese arsenide, which is antiferromagnetic, has a anneal temperature well above um, room temperature. So it may well turn out to be a very useful uh, material. Only a couple of years ago, uh, we started on a project on um, intermediate band um, uh, solar cells with a, a Marie Curie fellow um, uh, at, at our lab. She came from the, the group in Madrid. Um, and just this year, um, we're starting on two new projects, one on photocathodes by MBE with a company called Photech, um, and one on um, uh, the growth of graphene boron nitride um, with um, uh, a, a piece of kit that at present is unique in the world. It has a, the highest possible substrate temperature. Um, unbelievably hot. Uh, but we'll hear more about that later. Okay. A couple more things uh, before I finish. Um, back in the, in the sort of 80s and 90s, CBE became the preferred method. Uh, there were separate conferences for CBE. It died. Where's it gone to? Um, I mean, one of the things that, that is curious is that if you look at a, a typical MBE read oscillation, it dies uh, after, uh, in this case, about 35 seconds. You can prolong it by adjusting the, the conditions. But under the same conditions, the read oscillations for CBE go on forever. Um, so th there's something curious going on here that we still don't understand. So there, there is mileage in MBE in the future. That's, that's what I want to say. There's lots more to do. Um, couple, several myths uh, that I want to uh, discuss finally. Um, OK, we, we heard uh, earlier uh, about um, read streaks uh, fr from Al. And it's become, in the literature, it's nothing to do with Al. Al didn't make this mistake at all, so I'm not blaming him for this. Um, 
you see repeated over and over again that reed streaks correspond to atomically flat surfaces. It's complete and utter nonsense. Okay? The reed streak occurs as a result of disorder on the surface. Okay? You can see this very easily if you look at um, a, a really perfect surface, as Al correctly said, the Eval sphere cuts uh, the reciprocal rad uh, lattice rods in sharp points. Um, if anybody ever wants to see an example of a really good reed pattern, look at a silicon 7x7 seven seven surface. It's really a whole series of arcs with sharp spots. An atomically flat surface will not give you a reed streak at all. Uh, okay, so that, that's the first thing. Okay. The second thing I read in everything is MVE gives atomically sharp interfaces. Complete nonsense. Uh, okay, the, the, when you look at the surface with um, scanning tunneling microscopy, it exists over two to three monolayers at the minimum. Okay. So this statement, again, is completely wrong. Finally, I want to introduce a complete heresy. Okay. Um, why do we bake our systems after a reload? Sorry. Okay. The reason is historical. When we started, those cells were in incredibly tiny, so the growth uh, took place at one sample at a time, you bake the system every time. The cells gradually got larger, our growth campaigns are now more than a year. So why on earth do we spend time baking a system, making everything leak, um, just grow a few layers at the beginning, clean up the system, and away you go. Okay. That's my final bit of advice, it's probably all wrong. But there you go. <laughs> okay, with that, I'd like to finish and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>